Is that me? Okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I had Discord open so I could read the thing. I need to shut that thing off. Well, hello. Thanks for having me uh, on your on your show, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about all sorts of dirty and filthy things, so I'm ready. I am primed. Yeah, let's do it. Totally. A lot of bulk. A lot of bulk. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I abhor prep. Uh, I go in almost cold. Uh, it, usually 15 to 20 minutes before, I will sketch out a broad outline and come up with a few cool ideas and then see where the players take me. Uh, in, there are times when, like we do a podcast called Rob's Basement, where I will sometimes run and other people will run. And when I run those games, I will do a little bit more preparation. But generally, I'm all about just kind of screwing off and having mm -hmm. a good time. Excellent. Yeah. I like that. And so you, you really like the improvisational, just uh, fuck around until it works method? Yeah. Excellent. Well, I, I kind of, a couple, several years ago, I figured out that when I let the players kind of guide the plot by asking interesting questions, the adventure kind of unfolds in a way that makes it almost more interesting than whatever I could come up with. <laughs> I'm pretty fast in my feet, so it's it's never it's never bad. Yeah, well, not, it is bad sometimes. But... <laughs> yeah, and so I've listened to a lot of episodes of Rob's Basement, which, if any of you don't know, Rob has an amazing podcast uh, where they go into all sorts of terrible things in both Shadow Demon Lord, and you also did some punk apocalyptic playtesting on there, right? We did. Uh, my well, I was out of town. Uh, some friends ran. Uh, well, members of the Rob's Basement Gaming Group uh, ran an episode of Puck Apocalyptic to give a live play kind of thing going on there, and that was a lot of fun. But we've played Forbidden Lands. We're playing Call of Cthulhu right now, and we are also playing Advanced Fighting Fantasy. Very fun. I'll have to check in. I haven't listened to some of the newer ones. I'm excited for how you guys do Call of Cthulhu. I think that's a very uh, fun genre mix there. Yeah, it's a it's a profoundly foul experience. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we, we do a good job. We're 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 a little bit more serious than we are when playing other games. Nice, a little bit. slightly, Just yeah. Uh, I remember listening to one of the episodes, and there was a moment that was very inspiring for me, as I was sort of learning how to GM and learning how to figure out how to improvise on the spot. And you were describing a dungeon door, and it could have just been this really generic. Okay, you see a wooden door. And instead, you described how there's this face inscribed on this door, and in like every couple minutes, it like glares and then coughs up a small mouse. And I was waiting for that to be like some sort of critical part of the adventure. And nope, you just like keep going. And that was just part of this amazing dungeon design. What do you do in order to keep that creative energy to be able to bring things like that out of nowhere? Uh, so I 
I am a voracious reader, uh, and I so I, I I'm currently re I'm currently reading 22 books simultaneously. <laughs> nice. I'm glad and, you have that number off the top of your head. It, I do. <laughs> uh, I, re I refresh my book count to 22 at the start of every month, which is a little crazy, uh, but that's okay. Um, so I do that, and then uh, I take my inspiration for wherever I can really find it. So I watch, a, I, I follow a lot of shows, and uh, as I said, I read a lot, and I'm always uh, looking at other games. And pretty much what I think about when I'm running a game is to create situations that make me a little uncomfortable and might make the, the player base a little more uncomfortable. Nice. And kind of just play on the weird and... And, and and not the super upsetting. I don't want to, mm -hmm. we don't cross any lines, but uh, it's all about just trying to defeat the player's expectations. Um, okay, so like, keep them on their toes to keep things changing. Yeah. I like that. That's that's really good advice. And I, I wanted to say that that was really inspirational. This this like off the cuff description of a door coughing up mice. Like that's something that has stuck with me for years. The other thing too is that it's, you should never, like one of the things that one of my big rules is that there's never, there should never be a situation where there's just an empty room. Mm -hmm. You're going to present something at the at yep. table. Yep. There should always be something to interact with, explore, understand, or just look at. Yes. I feel the same way about perception checks where yeah. it's like roll to see if you do something interesting or you see something interesting. And that's right. not a good way to go about it. You know, you GA master shouldn't go in hoping that someone rolls a success so then you can tell them this cool description that you had for the dungeon room just give it to them right and... I, i'm a firm believer that perception should be excised from every role playing <laughs> <character>. <laughs> though because i do have to point out shadow the demon lord and punk apocalyptic both have a perception they, they do and <laughs> uh so the, there's a reason for for it in uh all right so for shadow the reason why I used perception was I wanted to have a foil for illusions. Mm -hmm. And so it was a purely a mechanical exercise, but the game is very careful to steer game masters around yep. to, if you're listening to a door, you don't roll, you just tell them what they hear. Uh, and then if you're looking for something particular location, you reveal whatever is at that location, there shouldn't be a roll in front of it. So perception op operates more as kind of a diffusing surprise and then also kind of piercing illusions and punk apocalyptic it was mostly a way for us to preserve that mechanic because there is there are some illusory illusory things uh in uh through muta mental mutations but uh going forward i've just stripped the mechanic out uh shadow the mad wizard it's gone <laughs> um, and we're doing a cyberpunk version of demon lord that's a license with another company uh it's and I'm working a way around to try to find a way to get rid of it completely because we just don't need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found that Gumshoe games do a tremendous job uh, yeah. doing that sort of thing. I, I always look to Gumshoe when designing adventures because they do it in such a way that it makes so that it logically flows forward. You don't need to rely on that critical perception role. Oh, for sure, yeah. So you did bring up a couple of the other projects you're working on. Uh, you mentioned a cyberpunk thing. I think we'll circle around to that because I'm very interested uh, in that because I know we've, we've ta heard a little bit about possibly a generic version coming about and things like that. Right. So the I've got a, looking at my desktop, I've got a pile of things that are all in works. So one of the big things that I'm working on right now is uh, Demon Lord for everybody mm -hmm. uh, because Demon Lord's has, I think Demon Lord has shown to have a lot of appeal, but its horror qualities can turn people off. I mean, not everybody yep. wants people defecation in their game. That's not exactly the example I was about to bring up. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's a that's a thing. And then, you know, the, the mythology and lore of the game kind of reveals that the new god is the devil and that the Demon Lord is actually the wreckage of the divine yep. that was betrayed by the Demiurge. So it's really a dark and negative game uh shadow the mad wizard says let's preserve the engine and put in a more traditional high fantasy type setting mm -hmm. and that should be probably out in 2020 uh works proceeding with that it's taking some change it's making some changes to the core engine but not anything that would make surprise anybody mm -hmm. uh the cyberpunk thing i really can't talk too much about other than the fact to say other than to say that it's an existing property uh, it will be using, uh, it'll be a new version of that property that is powered by the Demon Lord engine. 
that sounds really fun and i'm quite yeah. excited for that because i think that there's going to be and making sure this game is compatible with demon lord and mad wizard is really important mm -hmm. so you can you can drag stuff over from one yeah another. and and it works very well and i think you've clearly put a lot of thought into how demon lord works and yeah. I think it's really good that you're sort of riding on that, the, the lessons learned, and being able to keep that in with future games. Right. The, the, there is another thing that I should mention is that we're doing a series of uh, super dark micro games called Worlds in Shadow. Mm -hmm. And they're all standalone role-playing games. The first one that's coming out um, in about halfway through design is called uh, Lost and Found where you play orphans who wake up in a really spooky, scary orphanage. And your job as orphans is to find your way out and escape. And there are things called tear spiders that will drink your tears away until they rip your eyeballs. Okay, away. I'm getting some Coraline vibes from this. Coraline, and if you uh, remember the video game Little Nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really fun. And I, there have been several games that I've really wanted to play that were based around the sort of childhood horror. Right. And I have yet to find a group who actually wants to do that with me. Uh, well, you know, it's funny because I did, I did do, uh, at the start of my career, I worked on Grimm for Fantasy Flight mm -hmm. game and a D20 version of that. And then I did another version of a childhood horror game in, called The Razor and the Apple for the True 20 system way, way back. Uh, so... It feels like this is kind of my last go of trying to capture what is frightening about being a child mm -hmm. in a dark and spooky place. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're not taking that one to Kickstarter. That will come out on its own. That'll be really fun. What are some other of the worlds in Shadow? So there was a, I went to the bar one day. I know it's shocking. Uh, <laughs> I went to the bar one day, and I uh, had my notebook, and I was... Uh, brainstorming. So I came up with a list of 30 possible micro games, and some of them include Colony, where you are uh, in a dropship type vehicle thing that lands on a death world, and it is a game of brutal survival as you're trying to find resources mm -hmm. in the environment around you and stay alive. Okay. And keep the colony alive. Are the players working uh, together? Yeah. They're all part of the mm -hmm. same crew. Uh, we also have, uh, what was the other one? Um, there's a Barbarians or Vikings versus Cthulhu <laughs> game that I've got in the works uh, where you play a tribe and you're kind of watching after your little community and you make forays off into the mountains where there are more and more dangerous things that are starting to crop up and boil up from the depths of the earth as the as you're approaching Ragnarok. So there, there, are, there are a variety of games that are in this genre and all of them will just require the one rule book which is worlds in shadow which gives you the basic rules of the game mm -hmm. and then each micro game gives you the exceptions to that game okay and sort of ways to tailor it to that specific genre yep that's really fun i'm really excited to see where that comes out if you remember uh back when polyhedron was being published for uh this was back when it was dungeon of polyhedron they would put in micro d20 games uh, so there was an Omega World, and there Chris Premis wrote a World War One game that was super badass, and there were several others that also appeared in that same vein. And I kind of wanted to do the same thing with the Demon Lord engine because I think that, you know, if Lost and Found takes off and people really dig it, then I can do more stuff for Lost and Found. We could go from the orphanage to the spooky Thomas Ligotti style town that nice. lives out, out of the orphanage. <laughs> Very cool. Well, then that is our job at Penny for a Tale and basically everyone else who is a fan of Rob's work around the internet to make sure that this thing is amazing. Uh, and, and on that note, uh, everybody, if you haven't backed Punk Apocalyptic, go do it right now. Like, stop the stream. We'll still be here when you come back after you've backed. I expect all of the, the maximum tiers to be filled by the time this stream is over. I mean, for the love of Christmas, Pete, I'm desperate now. Let's do it. <laughs> And so as far as Punk Apocalyptic goes, um, because that's obviously the, the most current, the most um, upcoming thing that's, that's going to be coming the way from your terrible, twisted mind, um, what makes Punk Apocalyptic different from other apocalyptic role-playing games? For those who don't know, Punk Apocalyptic is uh, coming very soon. Check it out on Kickstarter, and we should get it in the chat soon. 
So I think the thing that <coughs> excuse me, sorry. <coughs> Don't die. Ah, all right. So the thing about Punk Apocalyptic is that do you remember the role playing game called Human Occupied Landfill? I've heard about it. I have not read it myself. All right, it's a filthy, filthy book. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the reason why I mentioned this book, uh, it was put out by White Wolf back in the nineties. Uh, and it was basically an unplayable game, but it was super funny. Uh, the point of bringing that up is that human. I would liken Punk Apocalyptic RPG to what if Human Occupied Landfill and Gamma World got together and made a baby. And that's pretty much what this is. Now, the thing about uh, the reason why I went for the uh, far more adult tone of this game mm -hmm. is that the miniatures game on which it's based is also of the same tone throughout. So they, and, and, and some of that stuff culturally doesn't really translate to our modern sensibilities. Uh, so I have kind of softened some things and ratcheted up others where I could, mm -hmm. but it is a, it is a very aggressive game. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the premise is, is that you're in uh, the wasteland, which is after uh, the, all the rich people, decided they were going to build these uh, mega cities called the megalopoli and retreat to these places to kind of wait out the destruction of the world. And to keep the riffraff away, they basically nuked and, bio and used biological warfare to eradicate anybody else who was trying to get inside. So the game focuses strictly on the wasteland and there, which is this blasted region where it's all pretty much scarcity and want uh, in the shadow of these giant domed cities that uh, have gone to war with each other and blast each other out of existence. Uh, and so it, it becomes, a, it's, it really, it's a really fun and interesting setting because the miniatures game has some really interesting factions called the Fifth Reich, for example, which is not to celebrate Nazis, but rather to give you yet one more excuse to kick <laughs> Nazi ass. Yeah, exactly. And, and what I find uh, charming about the Fifth Reich is that they're, they, the the story is they uncovered this collector's cache of uh, Nazi memor memorabilia, and this guy decides he hates mutants, and so he forms uh, this new Reich in order to be able to fight the mutants, but he doesn't know if the Fourth Reich ever happened because <laughs> history's been destroyed, so they went with the Fifth Reich just to be safe. Nice, yes, yeah, yeah. You're not really sure. You're reading some of the Hitler books. You're like, wait, right. what's the chronology here? I love that. Yeah, so it's it's silly, but it's um, but it's got a good a good chunk of ultra violence in it as well. It's a <laughs> it's a fast game, plays pretty easy, and. Uh, I'm working on a conversion document, which will allow you to bring Shadow of the Demon Lord stuff into Punk Apocalyptic. I fully plan on using that. Yeah. I mean, we tried, I, I experimented with that with Godless uh, as a supplement for Demon Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, this will kind of merge those two ideas into kind of a fuller RPG experience. That'll be really fun. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, in case anyone doesn't know, I will be running Punk Apocalyptic based on the quick start rules after this interview. That should be starting somewhere around 7.30, so remember, we will be there for that. Uh, Rob, will you be watching? I, I, will, I, will, I will try to watch some of it, yes. Okay, I will try to make it live up to your standards Please. of gruesomeness. Please. Make it filthy. I plan on it. And as a bit of a hint, uh, the main antagonists, uh, the antagonists uh, that they're going to be facing in this are called the Cooch Rockets, so everybody look forward to that. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, with this Kickstarter campaign going on, uh, we have several stretch goals planned. Would you tell us a little bit about some of the stretch goals for Punk Apocalyptic? Yeah, so the first one that's up on deck is, uh, well, actually, before I even go there, um, I reached out to my good friends, uh, Stephen Randy Farland and T.S. Lucard and Owen Casey Stevens to write uh, three adventures that are set, or three missions, rather, that are set in this world. Uh, for the kids at home who are not aware of these people, Stephen Radley Farland was one of the key designers on Pathfinder 2nd Edition. He was one of the architects on D&D 4th Edition, has written all sorts of really cool stuff. And right now he's focused on his new RPG called Delve, which uh, is a super intense, awesome uh, fantasy dungeon crawler. It's a lot of fun. Um, and you see some of the DNA that's in Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, matches up with Delve 
but Delph takes it to a step further and makes it even better. Um, T.S. Lucard has worked with, I've been working with him since Red Star, uh, which was published by Green Ronin way, way, way back. Uh, he was one of the guys who worked on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition. Uh, he worked on Dark Heresy, wrote in a bunch of other stuff for War, the Warhammer Worlds. I think he was also involved in the Middle Earth role-playing game uh, for the D20 system. And then Owen Casey Stevens probably doesn't need any introduction at all, given his pedigree of the mastermind behind Rogue Genius Games, uh, also a one of the key designers on Starfinder. Anyway, all these guys bring uh, just a fuck ton of mm -hmm. experience. Uh, and they're going to create uh, some really, really delightful missions to terrorize your players. Excellent. So that's the first thing, and that's already unlocked. We unlocked that at 35001. Uh, we've got coming up next the Scumbag's Guide to Scrap Bridge. Uh, Scrap Bridge is the kind of point of light in the darkness of the wasteland. Uh, it's basically a sprawling city that's built onto a bridge that's still intact and it's all kind of built up around it. It's got a lot of really interesting characters and venture opportunities. We're going to add new paths uh, and new character options to go with it. Uh, next up, it, when we hit 45,000, we're doing Blood and Bullets, which is a trio of missions. They'll be interlocking to kind of plug in to give you a short campaign for, uh, for the setting. The one I'm most excited about, though, is The Great Southern Wastes, uh, where I turn the radioactive south of the United States into a brand new campaign setting for Punk Apocalyptic. Nice. Your basis will be in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but it'll be suitably renamed. Murfreesboro, Tennessee is where I live and it's also the home of the world's largest cedar bucket. So if you ever wanted to see the world's largest cedar bucket, which will survive into the apocalypse, <laughs> uh, and fight mutants and deal with a bunch of new factions and some weird stuff there, it's going to be pretty badass. All right. Looking forward to that. That does sound like a fun stuff one. I'm hoping we get all the way there. And like I said, I fully expect uh, for us to get all of those stretch goals by the end of this stream. So come on, guys. <laughs> I'm demanding. So <laughs> what? <laughs> for, yeah, for sure. I, I did have a question. So I was as I was reading through the Punk Apocalyptic rule book, the quick start that we have out. I was wondering, does leveling, does that work out, work very differently than it did in Demon Lord? Nope, same thing. Okay, uh, one to ten? Yeah. Zero to ten? What we basically did was, what I did with this game was that I got rid of the whole concept of level, and you're just tracking the number of missions you complete. Okay. So when you complete a mission, you you get a tick, and then you get to upgrade your character based on the experience you have from completing a mission. Sure. Missions still focus on the most important parts in your character's career, so we don't worry so much about downtime and other things that go on. These are the most interesting and exciting stories your character, that you will tell about your character. Very fun. And when you have the, the leveling up, I'm assuming that you're going to have several paths like Demon Lord as well, and you get one option from one of the paths every time you level up? Or Just like Demon Lord, you've got, you've got a set of four uh, novice paths, mm -hmm. and eight expert paths, and 16 to 24 master paths. Uh, I'm most excited about the Messiah master path, which lets you turn water into wine. And <laughs> Super sacrilegious, but it is great. That will be a lot of fun. And I know that all of my Demon Lord games have turned a little bit sacrilegious in various ways. Not through but, any intention on my part. That's just sort of what the game tends to lead itself to. So just to give you a little bit more information on the Messiah, you get, uh, at, when you complete your seventh mission, you get a, a couple of talents called, well, the most important one is Feed the Multitudes which lets you turn one unit of water or one unit of food into 3d6 units of water. Or 3D6 <laughs> units of food. Uh, and then you've got, uh, at, when you hit your 10th mission, you get roll the stone. If you die and your corpse still has a head, you return to life three days later. Uh, upon returning to life, you also heal all damage. So it's, it's, it's chewy. It's a little delicious. But... <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun. So that does bring up the question. Have you ever had someone like boycott your product for, for any supposed Satanist tendencies or anything like that? Sort of the satanic panic? Man, I really wish I would. Uh, <laughs> a lot of great press. Um, I, keep, I keep threatening to send Pat Robertson a copy of Demon Lord. <laughs> but I just, you know, 
he doesn't really rate on my regular daily thoughts, but yeah. I, I think about it every once in a while. <laughs> Just so that you can really rile them up so that then they right. start bringing people. That's a, it's a good Demon business Lord, model. Yeah. I mean, with Demon Lord, I was, you know, I was kind of working out some of my own um, stuff from growing up. My parents were, or at least my mom was very much against uh, me playing Dungeons and Dragons because she felt that it was Satan's tool to convince me that uh, life in, or eternity in the fires would be better. And I would earn that because I was getting experience points or whatever <laughs> bullshit she wanted to throw at me. Uh, so I felt like, you know, D and D is pretty, pretty, pretty tame. So demon Lord would have to be the game. <laughs> yeah. You got to kick it up a notch. Right. It's genuinely un unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, when players encountered some of the creatures that can like permanently <laughs> pluck out your eyes and and do things like that to you that you don't recover from, uh, that was a real yeah. eye-opening moment. Uh, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, yeah, sure for them yeah. at that moment. I, I, I part of the Demon Lord experience is has always been that character creation is really fast, and because you're playing in a horror fantasy game as opposed to even just a dark fantasy game. There's no expectation that you're going to come through the experience alive, mm -hmm. because I think it's it's weird that people would go to a horror movie and expect all the characters who all the protagonists to emerge from the experience feeling good about themselves. Yeah, yeah, and they, they, if they if they do get through, then they should be changed from the experience. And I right. think that's where the corruption mechanics come in and insanity. Yep. And uh, then of course there's the uh, additional supplement for Shadow of the Demon Lord where you can make injuries far far worse than they were before so you right. get some nice lasting injuries and even worse insanity yeah and so if your character if you i mean it, I, I would feel like in a demon lord campaign if you go through two or three characters in life of the campaign you're probably doing it right mm -hmm. yeah i agree and and it's fun because you're able to pick the different paths and sort of come up with a new combination that when you started you didn't have the foresight to choose that i want to go you know i want to be yeah an oracle after i become you know a priest and so on yeah, uh, and that that lesson is something that I still struggle with when running Demon Lord campaigns, uh, because I, I posted on Meetup like this is a dark fantasy game. You will probably not survive all the way to the end of the campaign. You will not be big heroes. You will sort of be scrambling to make it in this terrible dark world. And then when the first character died in the first session after taking on a big boss by themselves and they died in one hit. I swear, like, 50% of the people thought about quitting, like, at that moment. They're like, oh, God. And then I was able to be like, all right, hold on, guys. Like, put down your pitchforks. <laughs> and then we were able to get forward with this new understanding that, yeah, you will die if you're dumb and if you're unlucky. I mean, it's it's the same kind of – there's there's a different social contract in Demon Lord, and it, it mirrors what the contract is in Call of Cthulhu. Call of mm -hmm. Cthulhu – urges you to look in places you shouldn't and the game is very safe if you do nothing yeah but boring. but if you right but if you start hunting if you start doing what the game expects you to do you get punished for it yeah exactly it's okay because that's the fun yeah you should look forward to the degradation of your character you should look forward to right. seeing what things happen to them and whether they will make it out instead of having this assumption that you're going to be a big damn hero sort of take a power by the apocalypse mentality and play to find out Right, right. Yeah, and and I that's actually something that Demon Lord really opened my eyes for when I first got it because Demon Lord was the first game that I purchased outside of Pathfinder, mm. and that was a huge revelation for me. And I I had actually sort of hacked my horror Pathfinder campaign, and I was using dice instead of modifiers. And then I heard about this amazing new system, and I was like, wow, that's actually really similar to what I'm trying to do with this. And then it opened a whole new world of uh, RPGs for me. And, and as I told you before we started streaming, these aren't actually my books, uh, but I do have plenty of my own books now. And I'm really excited to see where all of these other smaller, lesser known RPGs, what sort of ideas that they can bring to the table. And I'm really glad that yours is, by the way, coming to the forefront because I'm hearing people talk about Shadow of the Demon Lord a lot more in the past six months than I have in the years before that. That's great. That makes me very happy. Yes, it's, hail it's Satan. very hail Satan. It's very exciting, and I'm pumped to see where it's gonna go. Uh, and so, on a little bit different note, one of the things that I was also very impressed with the Shadow of the Demon Lord is your adventures. And 
In the same way, the adventure for Punk Apocalyptic, which you guys can see in the chat, uh, the Kickstarter there, the Quick Start has an adventure that's pretty brief. Uh, I won't be running it tonight. I'll be running my own adventure. But I really like how you keep all of your your adventures succinct. You don't have any extraneous things in there. And uh, recently, uh, Mitchell and the followers of the stream will obviously know who Mitchell is. Mitchell is the main person who runs. I just uh, kicked him out of his chair for today because I really wanted to interview Robert J. Schwab. Uh, and uh, so Mitchell and uh, everybody, we <laughs> we really are excited to, to have all of this together. Uh, and I sort of lost my train of thought there, so give me a second to collect it. Um, but, oh, and we, we were working on an adventure together. So have you ever heard of Simbarum? Yeah. So Simbarum is, is kind of like a, I would call it more of a somber dark fantasy RPG. Yeah. It's, it's more of, it, it's less, you know, go and get ripped apart. And it's more of how will you walk out of the woods changed? You know, what's going to be different about you? And they had an adventure contest recently that was, uh, it was limited to, I believe, 1,500 words. And so Mitchell and I wrote an adventure for that, which we ended up winning, and it was called Rite of Passage, and we're very proud of it. Uh, yeah, and great. Yeah, it was it was really fun, and so it's, it's going to be produced by them or something like that. We haven't really heard exactly what's going on. But it was one of the hardest things was I was in charge of cutting it down to the 1,500 words. Mm -hmm. And that was not an easy task. Mitchell had this amazing description of these, these like 13 pillars, which each represented one part of barbarian society, and it like broke my heart to cut it. But I had to in order to make the cut. Do you have any advice for keeping adventures succinct and sort of killing your darlings in that way? Yeah, so that's a that's a that's something I've been wrestling with for my entire career. Uh, it is adventures are for me the hardest thing to design because there's so much wasted content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at you look at the way adventures have evolved over the years. I mean, there, there have been a few standouts that kind of break the rule. I would say Shudders over uh, Bogenhofen, maybe one of the greatest adventures ever written. Um, <clears throat> Bruce Cordell's Return to Tomb of Horrors is another one of those adventures that's just brilliant all the way through. Or basically anything by Bruce Cordell. Right, because you know, <laughs> I have my man crush on Bruce. <laughs> uh, but the, the thing about it is, is that with Demon Lord and even Puck Apocalyptic, what I, what I strive for is brevity. Because players want choices and they want those choices to be meaningful. So if you're starting to break out your trees where you have all these different decision points mm -hmm. that players can go, you realize that the, the wider that, tr that tree gets, the more that no one gets to experience. So the trick to it is, is that you just have to zoom in on what the most important elements are of every particular scene and trust that the game master has the wherewithal to spin this out into something better. So for example, if we're gonna go into a dungeon room and you and I are stomp, you were, I'm running a game and you and some of your friends are, are, are stomping around in this weird fucked up dungeon full of dick monsters and uh, the separating wounds. And if you slip into the wound, you go into this bizarre candy, uh, cotton candy realm that gradually drains away your body, your liquid in your body, and then you come out as an emaciated thing. So you don't go in there after you've done this, but you go into this one room. Mm -hmm. And in this room, what is the most, what's the one thing that your senses will pick up about this room? And it could be what you see, but it could be what you smell. It could be a sound. Uh, and we, we might, so I might say that you go into this room and you hear this horrific clanking that's coming from this strange machine that's in the center of this particular uh, weirdly shaped chamber. And you mm -hmm. might see a balcony around the top. And that's all I give you. Uh, we might say in the, in, the, in the adventure notes that we say that there are also uh, four degenerate humans that are up here that are carrying tools that are made out of the calcified remains of babies that were turned to stone in the wombs that have been since been carved into various notches so it can maintain the machine. And so that, that's, that's what you get. And then we say that these guys are running this machine because the machine is pumping necessary vital fluids to this horrific monster, which is the boss monster deeper in the dungeon. Sure. You could do that in a hundred words, right? And I think mm -hmm. I've given you a, a scene that's interesting 
and evocative. Yeah. And then if the players say, well, what's this machine made out of? The game master can then say, well, this based on the other information I've got, the machine's made out of uh, maybe a shellac skin. And there are mechanisms inside that are living organs mm -hmm. that are all kind of pumping the fluid together, whatever you want to do. And then you reveal the bad guys and all that stuff and it becomes exciting okay. and fun. But uh, it's all about, it. I think that we should not, as, as game designers or adventure writers, we should not be afraid of just delivering information, even in bullet points at this point. Because the thing about the, the big turnoff for a lot of game masters and what, what I think scares people off from the whole enterprise of being a good game master is being confronted with a 256 page book. And then you have to digest this entire thing. Yeah, you're like, okay, here's this textbook. Let me just memorize this textbook. The whole thing, because yeah. you, you know, the, the hard part is when you have really big campaigns is that if the audience, the players deviate from the script, then it falls to you to kind of kind of get them back. Yeah, you have to sort of track. force it. Mm -hmm. And that's and no one wants to be railroaded. So I find it better to let the let the campaign kind of evolve from the weird adventures you tell. Okay. You create. Yeah. So it sort of sounds like you you're almost uh, you're, you're you're talking about like building a, a the skeleton, building the gist, and then the game master can fill in the the fleshy bits around the person. Because the game master does it already, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got a character who happens to be uh, let, let's say we've got a rogue character in your group, and that character is hunting after someone who stabbed his dad 20 years ago as all rogues are as all rogues mm -hmm. are uh you you might be moved to include some sort of hook for that character in the adventure it's not my job as the adventure designer to tell you to do that you should know how to do yeah that. and there's no way you could have possibly predicted that so if right. you made this you know really cheesy someone shows up and then steals something from you and you know now all the players had this person simultaneously steal from them now you have to go get it. You, instead, your, your approach is just sort of say, let the game master do the thing. We're just going right. to give you the tools you need to run the actual adventure. Right. Okay. It, it, yeah. That's very helpful. I, and uh, I really love that style, and I'm really trying to emulate that in my own works as well. I think, and this is going to be really controversial, I think you can do, I think you can get one hour of adventure content for about every 800 words of text. It'd be interesting to, to do the math and sort of look at some of the best adventures and see what their word counts are and see, see how they use their space and how they use their words. Because I, I, know that, I know that a lot of adventures, like even like Castle Ravenloft, which I think is a, a great product, uh, it's loaded with stuff. And it's loaded with stuff that might never actually come to, to mm -hmm. you might never actually see at the table. And while that is inspiring, um, I think it'd be more inspiring to carve it up into smaller pieces and say, here's a really, really fucking cool adventure that I know I can do in four hours that everyone's going to walk away from minds blown and then be able to preserve those other elements that you've used elsewhere in that thing and put it together in whatever way makes sense for your campaign. Mm -hmm. and I know it's the same way, but it's, it's more daunting when you have to go through a giant book and carve those things out yourself. Okay. Rather than be presented, it's here's smaller pieces that I can. Yeah, make. so sort of keeping it modular. Yeah. So when you go about actually trying to write an adventure, and you have this grand idea for you know the cotton candy womb and the the desiccation and all of that, how do you actually get that to turn into a full, like written adventure? Like how how do you get it from an idea to something that's on paper and, and actually testable and, and you can run? So I guess I would talk about. For publishing, that is not sure. because I know that you you run it off a very low prep, right? Uh, so for publishing, like I guess the, for the occult philosophy Kickstarter, I was on the hook to write three adventures for mm -hmm. Demon, and they and were a lot put, of fun. They, thank you, uh, <laughs> fine country folk, cabaret, uh, yep. the grotesque, and uh, call the necromancer. So with call the necromancer, I want to talk about cabaret the grotesque because I this. I think Cabra the Grotesque may be the best thing I've ever done, but you know, that's just me. But I've been reading a lot of Thomas Ligotti because as I'm kind of grappling with being middle-aged and, you know, confronted with mortality and existential issues, uh, I've been reading, so I've been looking at writers to kind of help me navigate, you know, what is kind of my current headspace. Okay. And Ligotti is super negative and dark and terrible, but I adore it. <laughs> so, uh, Real good place to get your life lessons from, for sure. Sure, right. Uh, 
conspiracy against the human race. <laughs> uh, so I decided that I wanted to have what I, I was, I was just brainstorming and I said, what if we had a dude who is, uh, he's just a thrall of the demon Lord, which is pretty trite, but uh, he's doing it in an interesting way. And so the way he's doing it to bring his master through is to gradually possess the people around him with demons that he is releasing from the void. And why would he do this? Well, he's doing this because he wants to be able to make them controllable. Well, how do I control them? Well, you put on a fucking crazy show. Mm -hmm. And so the premise of the adventure is that the Crimson King, which is my nod to Stephen King's obsession with the Crimson King, and also my adoration for King Crimson the band, uh, <laughs> is going to be uh, is his character. And so he is fleeing from the Inquisition and gets to this rotten, rundown part of this whatever city you want to put mm -hmm. it in. And so we, we, so I had my end, which is a confrontation with the Crimson King, and I knew that when you're going to confront him, that you're going to have to go through a bunch of fucked up peasants that are possessed by demons that are all doing weird stuff. And then I started so from, from there, it was like just how, what kind of set piece scenes do I have to create in order to get them to that end? And so then we have like the male prostitute who was beaten up by this gang. Mm -hmm. And so he's hiding out and he's being nursed to health. Or, no, it was not the male prostitutes nursing one of the Inquisitor's men to health, which is kind of a romance, but it's also kind of dark and weird. And then we have the gang where the gang leader steals the eyeball from every one of his agents because he can look into the eye, the, the freed eyeball and see out the other eye of the guy who's working for him. So just come up with all these upsetting, disturbing things mm -hmm. that are all kind of ways for the player characters to engage with the plot and get to the final set piece. Yeah. So when we were working, when I was working for Wizards, we were very... Uh, aware of trying to find way whenever well, where we were trying to find ways to make adventures more interesting and engage and make more engaging and james wyatt and others were uh building this system called the well design where you start with your end piece and you have these concentric circles that stack on top of each other and when you're whenever within a particular tier you can uh move around the tier through the narrative, or you can advance to the next highest tier to get to, or rather the next lowest tier to get to the bottom of the well where you have your final set piece. And so I try to model a lot of what I do using that kind of uh, mechanism. Okay. Sort of as like a, like the, the structure, the, the general method you go about to write these is you build these concentric circles and say, all right, in order to progress the story, we need to go up to the next level. Yep. And using that as a conceptual guideline. I like that. And I really liked Cabaret of the Grotesque. And it's funny, I have an interesting experience with that one because I read that adventure and I, my character was at the perfect level for them to go through it. And so I was putting it in, in this big sprawling city campaign that we were going through. And they were so worried about personal issues, they ended up not actually doing anything to do with it. But it was sort of in the backdrop for quite a while. And so it was kind of fun to be able to see, you know, there's all this this creepy stuff going on. They know there's this demonic show where all this stuff, but they're like, no, nah, we got to go take care of our character who's possessed by a demon for like the <laughs> seventh time. Uh, which is, by the way, pretty fun because that character's name was Jittery, and I do believe that Mitchell is playing his same character, or at least a character named Jittery with a G, for tonight's Punk Apocalyptic game. So we might see Jittery reincarnated. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, which is both a treat and a terror uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with that. But I really liked Cabaret of the Grotesque, and uh, I really liked how it was a sort of non-traditional layout and structure Thanks. for adventure design. And I think uh, if there's anyone in the comments who has specific questions for Schwab, now is a perfect time for it. Uh, but while we wait for some of those to come in... Uh, I wanted to circle back to your beginning to publish 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons content, right? Yep. What was your thought process going into that? What were your goals? So, I mean, one of the things about working on 5th edition that I regret, or, at, or having stopped working on 5th edition, was that I didn't do more to stay connected with the game. Uh, when I left Wizards, uh, 
it was fine. I mean, I said I worked with I worked with them afterwards, uh, but it was hard for me to adjust to a life after Wizards of the Coast. And I think mm -hmm. anybody who has ever worked for Wizards or TSR has a similar story to tell. And so why I did Demon Lord was to distance myself from that completely and as more of a cathartic experience to try to offload a lot of my baggage. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I got around to launching the Max Press imprint, I felt like there is an audience that Demon Lord can't reach. And it's largely because I think these days, D&D uh, &D is the conversation. Yeah. And while that's good in the sense that as long as D&D is doing well, everybody else is doing pretty well too. Uh, but I think it's an opportunity for me to reach people who mm -hmm. are looking for a different kind of play experience and don't feel comfortable, but don't feel comfortable leaving uh, the D&D &D sandbox. Or maybe never realize that there were other options, other styles yeah. of play. Right. So that's what I try to do with uh, Max Press was to say, hey, we can, you can make D&D &D into other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously people have done all sorts of things with D&D 5th edition already, but you don't have to be, you don't have to play it straight. You don't have to be heroes in a bright, shiny universe where at least two characters are gonna be tieflings who have no recognition of the fact that they are devil spawn at all, but are cute because they're horned and have tails. <laughs> Uh, or you're playing uh, cat people from some jungle area. You could actually play a game where you're doing things that are, I don't know, dark and meaningful and have repercussions. Yeah, it's sort of like a, a difference of scale, I think. Yeah. Whereas instead of, you know, collecting the four supreme gems to stop all this, it's sort of like, no, we got to prevent our people from starving to death. Right. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to, to see this branching out your your style of adventures and your style of games and content to come into the mainstream Dungeons and Dragons because I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to show them that there's a dark and terrible world out there uh, and there's also probably some happy games too but I've never really paid attention to those right <laughs> and been, uh what were you gonna say I was gonna say I, I've been like the last couple of days I've been really really struggling with uh my relationship with fifth edition and I'm thinking I'm going to do something bigger, like a like a real new, real true horror fantasy setting for D&D. &D. And yep. in the hopes of kind of shaking it up a little bit, mm -hmm. getting away from the stuff that's been done and done and done. And I don't know. We'll see. That looks very exciting. And I'm sure everyone watching will look for that as well. And speaking of, we do have a question from Determined Nerd who wants to know who in the tabletop industry is doing horror RPGs the best? Uh, Chaosium, probably. Uh, it's, it's, they're pretty hard to beat. Yeah, uh, I, I'm really good friends with Jim Louder, who works for them in their fiction department. Um, and we've been playing Call of Cthulhu. Normally, like a Rob's Basement podcast, we do just, we do like what, what it would be effectively one shots or three shots. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we had so much fun with the first adventure, we decided we we're going to do a second one. Uh, and so I, I'm i liking that a lot. I'm interested to see what the Riot Games guys are doing. We're gonna, I'm going to start a Lexa Cultum game nice. in a couple of weeks uh, if I can navigate the rule set. Mitchell uh, is actually running Lexa Cultum right now, I believe. I, well, if he has any wrong. tips for making characters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes some time, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's funny. I don't. I do buy role playing games still. Uh, I, I just recently got the new Chuck Tingle role playing game. Very excited about that. Uh, but uh, I don't do a lot of. I don't know. Right now, my focus is kind of looking at looking more into the past and seeing what was done way way back. Mm -hmm. Like I want to run Twilight Two Thousand. I want to run Original Top Secret. I want to run Star Frontiers. I want to run a Boot Hill game. I want to do uh, Traveler. I, I want to see some of these, what I think by modern standards are, will be more primitive, but to see what were the elements of those games that made them sticky and see what I can learn from that design. Yeah, and like wipe the book off so it's not nearly as sticky. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. 
to lick it up. <laughs> yeah, naturally. <laughs> uh, Mitchell does say that he'll be putting up pregens, so you can use his pregens for Lexicultum if you want. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that, that'll be good. We've actually talked a little bit about doing some Penny for a Tail original content uh, for the different games that are run. So for those of you watching, that could be something fun to look forward to in the future. Uh, and so I, we're, we're reaching towards the end of this. Uh, and I wanted to, first of all, uh, for those of you, if you're joining now uh, or if you've been watching the whole time, come and watch us when we run... Punk Apocalyptic at 7.30, and it's going to be a grim and horrible good time. I'm really excited for it, and if you haven't checked out the Kickstarter already, go see the Kickstarter, which should be in the chat, and uh, Rob, do you have any final thoughts for us? We've got seven days left in this Kickstarter. I'm sure we're going to unlock at least two stretch goals mm -hmm. before it's done. Otherwise, my liver might just quit. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say thank you very much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Sure. Well, we really appreciate having you here, and we hope that you continue to make dark and terrible things. I will do my best. All right. Then uh, we will end the stream.